Uh, I'm excited to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Lori White. She is the Vice Chancellor for, uh, for Student Affairs at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. White has spent over 30 years working in higher education, and prior to her arrival at WashU, Dr. White served as the Vice President for Student Affairs and a Clinical Professor of Education at Southern Methodist University. She's also worked at the University of Southern California, Stanford, Georgetown, San Diego State University, and the University of California, Irvine. At Washington University, Dr. White and her colleagues are responsible for a range of student life programs, including residence hall activities, student activities, student leadership programs, student conduct, the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, the First Year Student Center, and so much more. She has a history in Nakata. She served within Region 9 in a variety of positions. She served as the Director of Advising at Stanford University and also worked in advising at San Diego State. We're proud to have her, with us, her with, here with us today. Her claim to fame, as her bio says, and I do find great humor in this because you should challenge her on this later on, is that she can name the mascot of just about every Division I college, and she's working to learn all mascots for Division III as well. So challenge her on this later on. So I want to go ahead and turn it over, and please help me welcome Dr. Lori White. Good morning. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that wonderful introduction. And it's so great to see all of you here and to be back among my Nakata peeps. As Kevin said, Nakata was my professional home for so many years when I served as the Director of Advising at Stanford. And it's great to see how much the association has grown uh, in so many years. I'd also like to welcome you to my adopted home of St. Louis. Missouri, and in fact, when I told my family and friends that I was moving to St. Louis, Missouri, they said, are you moving to a flyover state? And I said, well, what's a flyover state? And they said, well, that's a state you fly over when you're traveling from one coast to the other. It's not a state that anybody actually stops in. So I am really glad that you all took the time to stop here in St. Louis. And before I begin my more formal remarks, there's just a few things that I want you all to know about me. And the first is that I come from the African-American call response tradition. Now, if you've ever been to a black church on Sunday, then you know all about the African-American call response tradition. Because in the black church on Sunday, when the preacher speaks and when the choir sings, they expect to hear a response from the audience. So if in the course of my remarks, I say anything that resonates with you, it's okay for you to say, wow, <laughs> all right, amen, go ahead on Dr. Lori, or you, as my students do, you can just snap, snap, snap in agreement. Second thing for you all to know about me is that I love to sing. Now, I'm not a trained singer by any stretch of the imagination. But when I speak, every now and then I might slip in a verse or two of a song to make a point or to contextualize my remarks. And some of my favorite songs are old Negro spirituals. They give me uplift when I need some. And they also connect me uh, with my ancestors from so long ago. So if I slip in a verse or two from an old Negro spiritual, I want you all to know that I am offering that from a cultural perspective and not from a religious perspective, because I don't want you all leaving Nakata saying that Dr. White trying to turn Nakata in to a revival conference. So that's not what that's about. <laughs> and then the third is that I come from an oral tradition, which means I like to tell stories. So you're probably going to hear me tell a few of those this morning. So as we come together in the city of St. Louis to talk about our work as advisors and mentors, I think having a deep deeper sense of the place where we're gathering will be helpful context for my remarks and hopefully for the conversations that occur during this conference. Kevin already talked about all the wonderful things that are part of this beautiful city of St. Louis, the Arch, Forest Park, of course the St. Louis Cardinals. We were also the site of the 1904 Olympics and the World's Fair and we're the founding city for many major corporations. I've already mentioned Anheuser-Busch and Ralston Peruna and the Brown Shoe Company. We also lay our 
claim to fame to many famous St. Louisans, including T.S. Eliot, who ironically uh, was the nephew of one of the co-founders of the institution where I work, Washington University in St. Louis. Some other famous St. Louisans are Tennessee Williams and Scott Joplin, Arthur Ashe, Chuck Berry, Dick Gregory, and one of my old-time favorites, Tina Turner. And the musical Meet Me in St. Louis was already mentioned. So those are all the things, of course, that we know and love about this beautiful city. We also, St. Louis and the state of Missouri, have a troubled history. And let me just share some important Missouri and St. Louis historical facts with you and some significant court cases that include the following. The Missouri Compromise. Missouri was admitted to the United States as a slave state, although interestingly, Missouri fought on the Union side in the Civil War because even as a slave state, Missouri had a long history of abolitionists living in the state. The 1857 Dred Scott case tried at the old courthouse right here in downtown St. Louis, which eventually went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision, the court held, and I quote, a Negro whose ancestors were imported in the U.S. and sold as slaves, whether enslaved or free, could not and never be an American citizen. The decision goes on to conclude that current or former slaves and their descendants had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. The Dred Scott decision is at the top of about every list of the worst Supreme Court decisions in history. The separation of the city of St. Louis from the county of St. Louis in 1876, which over the course of time has resulted in over 90 separate municipalities in the county of St. Louis, and a city that is overwhelmingly African American and without a significant tax base, and a county that is overwhelmingly white. The first part of the 20th century, St. Louis was one of the cities that was part of the great migration of African Americans out of the South to other parts of the country. And that great migration significantly increased the number of African Americans living here in the city of St. Louis. Consequently, in 1916, the voters of St. Louis approved a residential segregation ordinance that held that no one could move to a block or subdivision where over 75% of the residents were of another race. In the following year, when the Supreme Court ruled that such ordinances were illegal, neighborhoods turned to racial covenants, asking every family on the block or subdivision to sign a document promising never to sell to African Americans. In another seminal Supreme Court decision, Shelley versus Kramer, the court ruled in 1948 that these covenants were illegal and lifted legal restrictions to housing based on race. But because of these historical covenants, neighborhood segregation, like in many other urban cities, continues to be baked in to the fabric of the city of St. Louis. Additionally, under the umbrella of urban renewal, African American and other ethnic neighborhoods in St. Louis were demolished to make room for highways and commerce, resulting in the destruction of the African-American middle-class neighborhoods, churches, and social club. So consequently, many African-American families were first forced to relocate to other areas of the city from downtown, and many relocated to North St. Louis. So when you're talking to a St. Louis native, you might hear the expression, the Del Mar Divide. So today, north of Del Mar Boulevard, which is right around the corner from here, Neighborhoods are about 95% black, and south of Del Mar Boulevard, neighborhoods are almost two-thirds white, and the median household income is on average $25,000 higher south of Del Mar Boulevard. It wasn't only African Americans who were affected by urban renewal. Other ethnic groups were affected as well. In fact, the original Chinatown in St. Louis was right around the corner from this hotel, and it was raised to make way for building Bush Stadium, where the St. Louis Cardinals play. In fact, an article that I read regarding the history of St. Louis stated, racial segregation was institutionalized in St. Louis by intent, accident, or benign neglect throughout its history, affecting the nature of race relations in the city today. Which brings us to the present. Among 100 largest cities in the United States, the city of St. Louis is the fifth 
most segregated. The economic, political, and social fragmentation in the St. Louis region and throughout the state of Missouri has contributed to the racial and social conflict at the root of the Ferguson unrest, the protests at the University of Missouri, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, the protests we've had over the last few weeks in response to the Shockley verdict, and the NAACP travel advisory. And all of the aforementioned are pivotal moments in the resurgent national discussions on race, of which Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee during the national anthem, Charlottesville, the alt-right, conflicts over free speech on college campuses, they're all part of that same continuum. So according to a book I read by Clarence Long, who's the chair of the African and African American Studies Department at the University of Kansas, and author of a book titled Grassroots at the Gateway, Class, Politics, and Black Freedom Struggle in St. Louis says, you can make an argument that border states like Missouri have been bellwethers for where the nation as a whole may be headed. Missouri has been a laboratory for the dynamics of race and conflict we see nationally. In other words, what we've experienced recently in St. Louis is a precursor or a catalyst for similar events in other parts of the country. It's not just here in St. Louis, it's what is happening all across our country. So now you're thinking, well, I thought I was coming to an advising conference. Did I suddenly drop in on a meeting of the Historical Society or the National Conference for Sociologists? So my point in starting with this brief overview of St. Louis and Missouri is I wanted to give you a bit of history of the place where you're holding this conference and also to underscore that our history as a city and a state is the context in which I do my work as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at Washington University in St. Louis. It's the context which impacts which students have access to Washington University. It's the context that influence issues of campus climate and relationships among different groups of students. And it's the context that guides how I advise and mentor students. Now I'd argue that the same is true for all of you, that your work advising and mentoring students can't be separated from the context in which you do your work. And all of us must be cognizant of the range of issues academic and otherwise, impacting our students as they pursue their hopes and their dreams. So with that by way of a backdrop, the topic that I'd like to speak on today is academic advising in uncertain times, reflection, rejuvenation, rededication, and reconciliation. So my talk is gonna be part contextual in terms of framing the current environment in which we do our work, some of which I've already mentioned, in part personal, in terms of sharing with you some stories about what keeps me in the higher education field despite these uncertain times. And I'm also going to encourage you to think about what you can do to continue to stay engaged in our work and with our students. It's indeed an interesting time to be working in higher education. If you read any series of articles about the challenges we face on our campuses, here are some of the top issues that are demanding our attention. Student mental health, student diversity, campus safety, risk, and liability, advising and career services, student activism, social media, the rising cost of college, sexual assault, alcohol and drug abuse, student access, retention, and success. And I probably should have put up another bullet that said, whatever the federal government is going to require us to do. Yeah, no additional comments there. Uh, and there's probably a few other things that I've forgotten to add to the list. And we also do our work within the context of a volatile and uncertain world. And there's four things that I think are contributing to this volatility and uncertainty. Populism. We all know that populists and outsider candidates are impacting elections, not just here in the United States, but all over the world, driven by people angry with the status quo and are angry with perceived establishment candidates. People are losing faith in elected representatives that come from more traditional backgrounds. And through the ballot box, they're sending a message that they want change. And while young people on our campuses may not always cast a vote, though, we certainly should continue to encourage them to stay involved and engage in the political process, 
They are part of the, large the loud chorus of vo voices shouting, the status quo has got to go. And often our students see us, administrators on campus, as part of that status quo. Activism. All over the globe, people are sending change messages not only through the ballot box, but through other forms of activism, taking to the streets, using social media, or by some accounts, using any means necessary to protest perceived and real injustice. And our students are often active organizers or participants in these protests and calls for change. And because of digital communication, student activists all across the country and the world are connecting with one another as they're able to share information and tactics with one another. In fact, the Know Your Nine movement in support of Title IX, I think, is but one of many examples of how student activism around campus responses to sexual assault have connected students at colleges and universities across the country. And speaking of digital communication, in some ways, because of digital communication, we're more connected than ever. But we're also experiencing more isolationism in terms of our ability to actually engage in face-to-face -face communication with one another, and in particular, to engage in civil communication with those who may share different viewpoints. And then finally, terrorism. You know, sadly, when we talk about the volatility and uncertainty in this world, we can't ignore the threat and actuality of domestic and international terrorism. We all have this collective sense that our safety is constantly at risk, and the horrible shooting that took place last week in Las Vegas, preceded by the events in Charlottesville, preceded by the events in Orlando, preceded by so many similarly tragic events, tell us that our fear of safety has perhaps become our new reality. And for a young person in particular, I can only imagine the psychological impact of growing up with the potential threat of a terrorist act being an everyday fact of life. So now you all are thinking, as you might be feeling a bit depressed by all that I've just shared, I thought our speaker was going to uplift us. Isn't part of her speech talking about rejuvenation? So my point in highlighting the many issues that we're dealing with in our work as advisors and higher education professionals and in the world today is to acknowledge that our work is indeed challenging, made even more challenging against the backdrop of what is happening in our country and in the world. And to underscore that advising students successfully means understanding that all of these issues deeply impact our students, causing many stress and anxiety, influencing some to become so actively engaged in protesting whatever their definition of injustice is that their studies suffer, impacting what course of study some choose to pursue, and affecting the tenor of relationships among students and our campus climate. However, there is good news. Nakata, this is our time. I believe for those of us who are engaged in academic advising work in some way, shape, or form, this really is our time, because the work of academic advising professionals proper and those of us who advise and mentor students in other ways, it has never been more important than it is today, as we're central to the critical work at our respective colleges and universities that's focused on student access, success, retention, and graduation. And none of that work can happen without all of us in this room. <laughs> And it can't happen without our ability to exemplify Nakata's core values of respect, inclusivity, caring, and empowerment, among others. So knowing the integral role that we play on campus, I should be able to go to work every day with my Wonder Woman outfit and tackle all the problems on my campus <laughs> with my trusty sword and shield. However, as I approach my work, sometimes I feel, in the words of one of my favorite spirituals, that I've been in the storm so long. The song, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, goes like this. Been in the storm so long, 
I've been in the storm so long, children. I've been in the storm so long. Oh, give me the time to pray. My interpretation of the lyrics of the song is that the individual singing it is saying, I've been working, toiling, struggling, and I need a little time for rest and reflection before I have to get back to my work. And unfortunately, in our busy lives, we seldom have or take the time for rest and reflection. So I'd like to do is respond to the sentiments expressed in the verses of that song and focus the rest of my remarks today on those four words from the title of my talk, Reflection, Rejuvenation, Rededication, and Reconciliation, in the hopes that my sharing some personal anecdotes related to each of those four words will encourage you all to engage in similar sharing with your colleagues as part of this conference while you're exchanging those business cards over the course of this conference or when you get back to your campus in the next few weeks and months. So a few definitions. Reflection. Yes. Personally engaging in reflection about who I am and why I work in higher education and how I approach my work is what helps gird me for the next set of known and unknown challenges I may face in each new academic year. So who are you and how and why do you do this work called academic advising? Rejuvenation, realizing that our work can be mentally and emotionally draining, helps me remember to ask myself, what are the things that I need to do to be rejuvenated so I can be present for my students and the colleagues who depend upon my leadership as a senior student affairs officer? So what do each of you need to do to be rejuvenated in your advising role? And rededication, giving the stresses and strains of each academic year after 35 plus years in the field, am I still willing to stay in the storm so long? So what will it take for you to rededicate yourself to your work as an advisor and to our profession as educators? And reconciliation, thinking about the relationships that we have with one another, particularly with our colleagues and our students, how do we model reconciling relationships for our students? And I define a reconciling relationship as one that's based on a commitment to mutual respect, where there's no space for discrimination, stereotyping, mistrust, lack of openness, or untruthfulness. And a reconciling relationship, thank you for the snaps on that, is also one in which truth is tempered with forgiveness and anger is tempered with grace. So what must we each do to facilitate reconciling relationships in the toughest of times? If so you don't remember anything else about my remarks this morning, I hope you'll remember those four words, reflection, rejuvenation, rededication, reconciliation. Now I mentioned call response earlier, so I'm going to issue the call and I'm going to say each one of those words again and I want you to respond so I know the call has been heard. Reflection. Rejuvenation. Rededication. Reconciliation. All right. So I first want to talk about reflection. A few weeks ago, I had a chance to go with my husband to his college reunion at Purdue University. Yay, any Purdue folks? Right on. And it was a great time to take a walk down memory lane with my husband. So let me tell you a little bit about him. His name is Tony, and he is a first-generation college student. His parents, all right, right on. His parents didn't graduate from high school because they got pregnant with him. And even though his parents didn't graduate from high school, they were always very clear with Tony uh, that they valued education and they not only expected that he would graduate from high school, but that he would also graduate from college. 
He also grew up um, in a very low-income family. In fact, he tells me that there were days when he would open up the refrigerator and he could see his reflection in the back because there was no food. Uh, and days in the winter when he was cold because his family couldn't always afford to pay the heating bill. And when he would complain about being cold, his mama would say, boy, put on some more clothes and get under the covers. That'll keep you warm. He was always a good student. However, when it came time to apply to college, he had no idea how to apply and which schools that he should apply to. And he said that uh, he was taking his PSAT test and he saw a, a young uh, woman with whom he went to high school by the name of Don uh, sitting in front of him. I think he had a crush on Don. And uh, Don bubbled in uh, her PSAT test saying that she wanted her scores sent to Purdue University and to the University of Pennsylvania. So he figured he would do what Don did. <laughs> you know. So uh, sometime later, uh, Purdue invited him to come and visit the campus. And so for the first time, he got on a plane and he flew from East Orange, New Jersey uh, to West Lafayette, Indiana to visit Purdue. And while he was on campus, he attended a black fraternity party where he said there were a bunch of cute girls. And he ran into a friend of his who was a first year student from Purdue who was at his hometown. And some months later, when Purdue offered him admission, he said, that's where I'm going to go to college. <laughs> yeah, based on those two things. So uh, right before school started, uh, his parents put him on the Greyhound bus with a trunk uh, and a duffel bag uh, and sent him from East Orange, New Jersey to Indiana. I can only imagine how his parents must have felt um, sending their oldest child off to college to a place uh, they had never been. I am sure they were proud and I am sure they were also scared to death. So Tony travels the, on the Greyhound all the way uh, to Indiana, and he gets off at the Lafayette stop. So he unloads his big trunk, and he unloads his duffel bag, and the bus pulls out of the station. And it was at that moment he realized that West Lafayette and Lafayette are two different cities. He didn't have enough money to call a cab. Uh, and this is, of course, before cell phones, and so a call home would have meant a collect call. Um, his parents uh, didn't have any money to send him, so he knew if he called collect, not only could his par parents not afford the call, um, they would have been stressed out about trying to find a couple of dollars uh, to send him. So he managed to arrange to store his trunk at the Greyhound station and then proceeded to walk the three to four miles across the Wabash Bridge from uh, Lafayette to West Lafayette. He then arrives at the residence hall. Thank you. Yes, it, I got to say more. He then arrives at the, his residence hall, and it's now about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and the front desk is closed. And so there's no way for him to get a key to get inside of his room. So he's standing there trying to figure out what to do, trying not to lose it. And uh, thank goodness, out comes a good Samaritan a fellow student uh, who Tony didn't know, um, who said, hey, I have an extra bed in my room. Um, why don't you stay the night with me? Tony said he never saw that student again, uh, but he was forever grateful um, for that student um, giving him a place to rest for the night. Um, the next day, he uh, was able to borrow $20 from the person who recruited him to Purdue uh, and was able to go and get his trunk and his duffel bag and make it back to campus. And so I said to him, I said, honey, you must have been so scared. And he said, and this is a direct quote from him, I was scared, but not monster movie scared, but the kind of scared when you feel dread and despair and your immediate options and resources for resolution are limited to bleak. You feel like giving up before you begin. Yet at the same time, you feel compelled to not disappoint your family. So you steal yourself and trudge forward, not knowing if you will wind up in the abyss or land gently on solid ground. Now Tony had not attended new student orientation because no one told him that he was supposed to. Remember, he's a first-generation college student. So he still had to register for classes, 
which meant, if you remember back in the day, um, standing in line in the gym, trying to figure out which classes weren't closed so that he could get a schedule for the fall. A few other pivotal moments for Tony as an undergraduate student. He ended up on academic probation, but he consequently made a connection with the person who was his academic advisor, who ultimately became his inspiration for pursuing a career in higher education. He found a sense of community th through the Purdue Black House on campus, a gathering place for African-American students at Purdue, and he joined a historically African-American fraternity, this one, <laughs> with a strong brotherhood focused on high academic achievement. He also decided to stop out of Purdue after his first year and move home and enroll at the local community college so he could play basketball. He'd been a basketball star in high school and hadn't had success walking on to the basketball team at Purdue, so he thought he would go back home to the community college um, and become a basketball star. He had an uncle who many years earlier had given up a football scholarship uh, and returned home because this uncle felt he had to get a job and work to support his family. And so Tony told me that his uncle um, called him over, and as Tony would say, put his foot in my behind, and told me that I needed to go back to Purdue because I was not going to make it to the NBA going to the community college. So, <laughs> and I know we have many community college folks out here, and if he had wanted to go back to the community college for an academic reason, that would have made a lot of sense, but not to pursue an NBA career. He's about 6'4", but not tall enough probably to make it to the NBA. Ultimately, Tony graduated from Purdue with two degrees, bachelor's and a master's in clinical psychology, and he's currently working on his doctorate. In fact, he's a classmate of one of the former Nakata presidents, David. All right. <laughs> and he's had a long career uh, working in higher education. He's currently the assistant provost for student success at Washington University, working with first-generation students and students who are Pell Grant eligible. So life does come full circle. And by the way, Dawn, the girl he had the crush on in high school, who was the reason he applied to Purdue in the first place, she ended up going to Penn. <laughs> <laughs> so as Tony shared his story with me, I thought about all of the students that we work with every day, particularly our first generation students who's getting to and arriving at college are similar to Tony's and may be feeling in some way the same way that Tony felt. And I thought about how Tony's ability to succeed as a first-generation college student was impacted by the connection he made with an academic advisor, the resources and social support he found through the Black House at Purdue and through his fraternity, the tough love and mentorship he received from his uncle, and the random kindness of a stranger, a fellow student, who shared his room with Tony that night that he arrived on campus alone and scared. Tony and other students like Tony are why we do what we do advise and mentor students, create safe, safe spaces and places on campus that support and nurture students, be one of the people on campus that a student knows they can go to no matter what, whether they need to borrow $20 or something more. We offer tough love sometimes and sometimes just plain love, and we let students know that they don't have to be alone and scared. And it's not that I had forgotten that these are the critical advising roles that we play on campus. However, in the midst of dealing with all the other stuff on my plate, I needed to be reminded of the what and why of my work. So having this unexpected reflective opportunity that came in the form of a college reunion trip with my husband has helped me want to stay in the storm just a little while longer. So if you're also wondering whether you can stay in the storm, then I also encourage you to take some time while at this conference or over the next few weeks and months and think about and engage in some similar reflection about the encounters that remind you of the why you're doing this work that we call advising. Like the song that I just sang, I've been in the storm so long implies, I think it's the act of reflection that gives us the strength and power to keep going on. Rejuvenation. Now I spell rejuvenation in a lot of ways. How about the spa, the beach, a good book, 
spending time with family and friends. So when I need personal rejuvenation, those are some of the things that I do. But I think sometimes we need professional rejuvenation. In fact, I remember how excited I was when I first discovered the world of student affairs. You know, the first time somebody tells you you can get paid for all the stuff that you love to do, advise, mentor, counsel, and teach students, plan fun and engaging programs, feel like you're doing work that's making a difference, plus the added benefit of being that person on campus that everybody thinks is so cool. Yeah, that was me. And then I became a senior student affairs officer. Now, don't get me wrong. I would not be telling the truth if I didn't say that for the most part, I love being the senior student affairs officer on my campus. Being a vice president for student affairs is something I imagined I might one day become when I started my first job in student affairs back in 1981. And you know, it does feel pretty good to have achieved the career goal I set out for myself over 35 years ago. But how ironically, once I became a vice president for student affairs, I realized that most of my time wasn't spent doing those things that I mentioned that drew me to student affairs work in the first place. For example, unless I'm purposeful about my schedule, my administrative calendar of meetings and other administrative responsibility will cancel out any opportunity that I have to actually meet with a student. So there are times when I ask myself, so what happened to the fun and meaningful parts of my work? The reasons that I wanted to work in higher education to begin with. I think to myself, well, maybe I should have never moved on from being a hall director. Because at least when I was a hall director, I got a rent-free place to live. So perhaps from time to time, some of you also feel that way about your jobs, particularly those of you who've moved on from one-on-one -on -one advising to advising administrator roles. And when I start feeling that way about my work, I know I need some professional rejuvenation, something that reminds me of one of my other favorite spirituals. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. So coming to conferences like Nakata and others are a great space, I think, for professional rejuvenation. But what also rejuvenates me both professionally and personally is the opportunity to work with and mentor younger professionals in our field, folks who are undergraduate students who are thinking about a career in higher ed, or folks who are graduate students like one of the young women I met over here who's in the purple outfit. Stand up. She's a grad student. <laughs> and I think for many of our grads and some of the uh, undergraduate students that we mentor who ask us, well, how do I get to do what you do? I think the reason for their career choice is because they've seen folks like us making a difference in their own lives as students and in the institutions where they've attended and work. And our new and emerging professionals bring to our campuses diverse ideas and perspectives. They challenge us to think differently about our work so that we're able to better serve a new generation of students. And they always keep us on our toes by asking good and challenging questions about why we do the things the way we seemingly have always done them. So whenever I have a chance to interact with a younger professional in our field, I am reminded that regardless of the many challenges facing those of us who work in higher education, those of us who've chosen to serve as academic advisors or in other student affairs positions play such a critically important role on our campuses in terms of creating supportive communities for all of our students, responding to students in crisis, advocating for policies, programs, and services that impact student success, and being that voice at the table who says, and how will this, fill in the blank, impact our students? So in those stressful moments when I'm dealing with yet another campus crisis that causes me to wonder about my career choice as a student affairs professional, serving as a mentor to a newer professional in the field is a great way for me to pay forward the great advising and mentoring I've received that enabled me to achieve my own career goals. So as you think about what you need to do to be personally and professionally rejuvenated, I hope that that rejuvenation experience includes spending some time interacting with 
in mentoring someone newer to the field than you are. Getting a fresh perspective helps us more seasoned professionals remember that we truly have come a long way in a good sense, I hope, from where we started from. I know that I certainly have, and I certainly appreciate the energy that our grads and our younger professionals bring to our work and to our profession. Rededication. The end of the school year is, of course, graduation time, which means listening to a graduation speaker. And the picture on the screen is of United States Congressman John Lewis, who served as the 2016 graduation speaker at Washington University in St. Louis. He's one of the last surviving leaders of the civil rights movement. And his message at the graduation focused on the theme of finding a way to get in the way was one of the most inspiring I've ever heard at a graduation ceremony. And his words have continued to stay with me. His message was that we must stand up, speak up, and disrupt the status quo whenever and wherever we see injustice in the world. What was most inspiring, yes, thank you. What was most inspiring about his message for me was that even though this man has been through so much, despite all the battles he has fought, he is still in the fight. And at the age of 77, he is still preaching a message of hope and faith that we will one day live in a world of peace. John Lewis, yes, I hope we get there. John Lewis was at the March on Washington when Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech, a speech with which we are all familiar. One of Dr. King's other famous speeches is called The Drum Major Instinct, from which his famous quote, Say I was a drum major for justice, emanates. In his drum major speech, Dr. King makes the point that most individuals are more interested in being the drum major leading the parade for the accolades we receive as opposed to being driven to lead the parade in love and service to mankind. So he might volunteer a little here and there, maybe donate to a few charities, and be willing to help someone we personally know who is struggling. But we really don't want to do much more than that. It's not that we don't care about other people. We just don't really want to worry about trying to save the world when we have our own problems to deal with. And depending upon where we live, what we say, and how we say it, we may run the risk of danger to ourselves and to our families for speaking out. So given all of this, we think to ourselves, really, how could one person truly make a difference given all the problems in the world today? Or we ask ourselves whether the risk to ourselves personally or to our families is worth it. Yet, at the same time, all of our universities have somewhere in our mission statement that we attract, create, produce, and or shape world-changing and world-leading students. How can we help our students live up to our inspirational, excuse me, to our institutional values or our aspirational vision statements if we are not willing to be drum majors for justice ourselves? I mentioned earlier in my remarks that we're seeing student activism all over the world. As these students, our students, have seen and experienced injustice, they volunteered to be the drum majors for justice Dr. Martin Luther King describes in his famous drum major instinct speech. I recognize that those of us who work in higher ed sometimes feel tension between supporting our students' advocacy and being university administrators. However, are we going to let our students do all the work of ensuring that the world is equitable and just? Or are we as advisors and mentors to our students going to, in the words of John Lewis, find a way to get in the way and stand with them and stand up in our own communities? Certainly, given all the talent and wisdom in this world, we should be able to find a way to use our collective power of one to make our universities and the communities in which we work and live a better place, and to do so in a way where we find alignment between our personal values and the values of the institution for which we work. 
back when Charlie Nutt and I spoke on the phone prior to the beginning of this conference about the interest in many of you to participate in some way in the activism that is currently occurring in St. Louis, I commend you for your willingness to engage in this city, in my city. And just because we work for the university, or the man, as our students would describe it, that doesn't mean that we can't also, like, in our, like our students are doing, find a way to move those mountains of injustice on our campuses and our communities that have stood in the way for way too long. Because if we can't or won't do this, who will? And John Lewis, at the young age of 77, certainly don't feel no ways tired. And I thought to myself, as he brought his graduation speech to a close, if he's still on the battlefield, then surely I can stay on the battlefield. And in fact, one of the songs John Lewis sang during his early civil rights days, and probably is still singing, is, Gonna stay on the battlefield. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield. I am gonna stay on the battlefield. Till I die, I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. Till I die. So I hope that you too can find whatever strength that you need to stay on the battlefield of higher education because the work that we've chosen to do as academic advising professionals is too important for us to give up on just because sometimes we feel a little weary or worn. And then finally, I want to end by talking about reconciliation. And many of us, when we hear the word reconciliation, we think about reconciliation in terms of romantic relationships. I skipped a slide. <laughs> you know, all those break up to make up and will you come back to me songs that seem to be the main theme of all those old Motown songs that I grew up listening to. I'm going to skip those. <laughs> and before I met my husband Tony, I listened to way too many of those songs myself. However, that's a story for another day. So in the last part, and I'm going to get to the picture on this slide. So in the last part of my remarks, I don't want to talk about relationships gone bad, though I do want to talk about, not rom romantic relationships gone bad, but I do want to talk about other relationships. And I want us to ponder the question of how does one get to the spirit of raci re excuse me, relationship reconciliation in the context of the two words I mentioned during my introduction to this talk, those two words are truth and grace. On our campuses, we can certainly define relationships in many ways, including the relationships students have with one another, the relationships students have with our institutions, and the relationships students have with us. These intersecting relationships sometimes become strained on our campus communities, and students often look to us for help to help them navigate them to respond to and or resolve the relationships that they're finding challenging on campus for any number of reasons. Some examples of these more challenging campus relationships might include those between students who have different viewpoints on particular issues, our relationships with students who engage in behavior that hurts other students, either purposely or because of ignorance or poor judgment, or when students want to engage in a discussion on a controversial topic which might include inviting a speaker that offends other students, or when students are upset with us, the administration, because of our handling, or perhaps students' perception of our mishandling of any of the above. So how do we, as higher education professionals, deal with these sometimes contentious relationships on our campuses? And what does any of this have to do with our role as advisors? Recently, I had the chance to attend an international higher education conference. This one held not in Dublin, but in South Africa, which was my first visit to this country 
hence the picture of Nelson Mandela. And as you know, South Africa for many years practiced legalized racial discrimination in the form of apartheid. And in many ways, their history is not that much different than, our, than ours. And I contend much of the stuff that we're dealing with here in our country today is a result of the fact that we've not honestly and truthfully dealt with our own history and legacy of apartheid here in our country. Something South Africa did under the leadership of Nelson Mandela when he was finally freed from prison, when apartheid was finally being dismantled, was to establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to provide a forum for victims and perpetrators of the apartheid regime to tell their story. And while there's certainly, and while certainly a Truth and Reconciliation Commission alone could not right the wrongs of apartheid, and there have been many critics of this commission the Commission created a forum for those who'd been abused and violated by the system of apartheid to share their stories and to bring these abuses and violations into the open. And it's been said that South Africa's transition to democracy could not have occurred without the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Given the abuses of apartheid, the country could not have moved forward without such a forum. And what I think is important to understand about the South African example of reconciliation is that a process was established to give those who had been hurt by the action of others a forum to share their stories, as well as a process for those who had been perpetrators of the system of discrimination to also share their stories, sharing their respective truths in as open and transparent a way as possible. However, truth is only one part of getting to reconciliation the other I would offer, as I said in the beginning of my remarks, is the concept of grace. Universal spiritual is amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And the person singing that particular song is saying that no matter what I have done, grace is being offered to me. And this grace enables me to move forward despite my transgressions and my imperfections. So going back to my South African context, what we also know about South Africa is that Nelson Mandela, who was imprisoned by the apartheid system for 27 years, focused on the pursuit of reconciliation with his oppressors when he certainly could have chosen a different path. Grace was embedded into South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where perpetrators of apartheid were given amnesty for coming forward. There were many who were angry with Mandela for this offer of grace or amnesty to the oppressor. However, Mandela knew that grace had to be offered to his oppressors as a means of achieving the greater vision of a democratic and racially, economically, and socially dressed South Africa. My point here is not to idealize South Africa. It's a country like ours that still has many, many challenges. And South Africa had a clearly defined oppressor, where the U.S. election showed us that in this country, we have differing viewpoints regarding who is oppressing whom. However, those concepts of truth and grace have stuck with me as I pondered how I might use my South African experience personally and in my work. I know that I personally have a hard time listening to the truth of others who do not share my viewpoint, and it is tough to grant grace to those whose words and actions I believe negatively impact the people and the issues that I care about. However, we are not going to be able to move past the polarization occurring in our world and on our campuses unless we can figure out some way to get to truth and to grace. I don't have a mag magic formula as to how we get there. I only know that we must figure out how to try. And as advisors, we often hear from students who have felt that they are the targets of oppression or are being accused of oppressing, triggering, and or discriminating against other students. As advisors, we work with students in both of those categories, and they look to us for support. And as role models for how to interact with one another, in ways that are in alignment with our institutional 
and I hope all of our personal values of respect and care for one another's humanity. So I encourage us all to think about how we can work toward reconciliation. We need to role model a spirit of reconciliation for our students in particular, as they are our best hope for changing the current dynamics of our country. For the greater good of our collective humanity, I think we have to remember in the words of Bill Withers, lean on me, that we are interdependent on one another. So how about, like we did just a few minutes earlier, why don't we stand up and stretch our legs, join hands with someone, and I want you all to join me in singing Lean On Me. I know that you all remember the words to this song, all right? Lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm going to need somebody to lean on. So as we continue our conversations today and over the next academic year and beyond, let us give ourselves the space for rest and reflection. Let us find connections that rejuvenate us. Let us think about what will inspire us to stay on the battlefield, on our campuses and in our communities. And let us all be encouraged to think about how we can work toward reconciling relationships. Remember, this is our time. Thank you so much. <laughs>